Okay, this is a hard thing to do, to open up the session. With, um, because I'm going to take you to a world that might not be on your mental map. I came to Switzerland with my partner Hubert to ETH to probably teach something very different than what was being taught at ETH. Um, today's uh, lecture, Traces and Fragments, is fantastic because um, it serves a double purpose. Is I've been spending my whole life dealing with fragments, fragments of my life living between New York and Caracas, but also trying to trace the lines that could connect possibly the fragments of the city. Probably I would do you even better justice today if I talked to you about Carlos Scarpa, who was a fantastic architect in, in uh, Venice, who would sit lonely nights himself tracing uh, lines of his projects, uh, like the Castelvecchio Museum, which is a museum that's composed of fragments all put together. But I won't talk about architecture specifically. I'll talk about cities. I'll talk about what I observe. I'll talk about how I map and how I translate that into built form today. Let's see if we can get this going. So let me immerse you in this place that is a condition. Caracas is burning, the big one, Caracaso. It was 1988, and the Perez uh, administration was falling. Hey, IMF. I think memory is much more important than haste. And, uh, no, you can keep going. Go back. There we go. We start again. You can turn the sound up, uh, down very well. So, Caracas is burning the big one, Caracaso. It's 1988, and the Perez administration is preaching, go home, IMF, go home. A neutron bomb that killed people, left buildings standing. It's not 1989, and the Pettis power is falling. Pass me el paquete, Washington consensus. Where do I find space for 650,000 hors d'oeuvres? Guarena, San Cristobal, Mumbai, Barcelona. The barrios are ablaze. Paris, Banlieues. How does it feel to see your city go under? Yes, we have been allowing inequality to grow. But we are here now to talk about the 1% by the 1% for the 99%. We're here to build bridges to cinematic cities, to connect pixels to celluloid fantasies, to break binaries to third world epiphanies. We're building those bridges to those cinematic cities. Because these cities are both imagined and real. Strips of images of the rolling projection wheel. It's up to us to communicate, not to steal. Copy-paste urban editing with cold, rolled steel. We're building bridges to that cinematic city. We're making mental foundries cast rigid boundaries. We've been thinking in singularities, not multidisciplinarities. If we can relate the parts to the whole and fill the whole with the parts, we've got the smarts to work with pluralities diversity, as it was mentioned today, and all the while building bridges to those cinematic cities. Forget about utopia. This is a dispatch from the front lines of social transformation throughout the urban planet. It's a speculation on the future of the city as a vast modernizing landscape, from the North American sprawl to buildings in Latin America or in India. But situations, operations, structures, feedbacks in our continuous learning pattern. This manifestation of disagreement with today's passive political culture and social structures have led to the current ailments, ailments and failures in our cities. It's the call to engage with our collective problems, to face the urgent needs to implement systematic changes, to seek an exploration of the new, to a new territorial ecology, one that Bucky Fuller might have imagined. We'll talk about a little bit later in the next part. Today's cities are currently dealing with an assortment of issues and major roadblocks to development and integration, population growth, disease, hunger, rising food prices, the failing drug war, international debt, all corruption and crime. These issues were most noticeable in my city, in Caracas, in South America, but also prevalent in the North. 
If we examine these conditions, we see that many of them are undergoing major urban transformations in the last 20 years. But for whom? Technology for whom? Governance for whom? Latin America has more than tripled in population. However, with the economic growth comes rapid urbanization and massive population growth. Mexico's population has tripled in the last 50 years, which has led to uncontrolled urban expansion due to the city's inability to accommodate such an explosion. So now that we're immense, immersed into it, I lead you. This is the first picture of the founding of our office in the little Caracas barrio, um, where we decided to expand the role of the architect to become a kind of social entrepreneur. Hubert and myself, and the first team of the urban think tank. Thinkers, diverse people, interested and, and willing to take on the problems of segregation in cities. Of those first projects, we started to go into the barrios, into the place of the unknown, where none of my colleagues were working in Caracas. We decided, given the circumstance of economic turmoil, we said we can, as designers, affect that change. So it's fitting that we're sitting in a basketball auditorium today because our first project was a vertical gymnasium. It was a gym where we put sports courts one on top of the other to intensify sports in the slums because they have a need for recreation. There's not enough green space, there's not enough areas for play. And these floors of which you see here can be changed and new programs can be added and we tripled the amount of people doing sports. Diabetes was reduced. Kids were sent, uh, reinserted back into school, and crime rates dropped in the area 15%. So I only show that to give you a taste of our work. Those of you who are more interested in our work, we have a show in the Pinacotec Modern in uh, Munich now, and I would be more than glad to send you a catalog of that show. The show is also a project. It's the cheapest available <coughs> material, which is pipes. Uh, uh, sanitary plastic pipes that after the exhibition is traveled will be reused again. We don't waste a thing. Designed with, designed with scarcity in mind of resources. And the fabrics will be turned into handbags. And all the projects are like a Moroccan carpet tent, let's say, displayed with videos and films. But today I want to tell you about we, this moment that we're living, which is the last round ecology. Of course, this was the vision of Apollo 8, of seeing the great blue world, the uh, watery void of Earth. But now, that Earth image is an interconnected, urbanized planet. But of course, this is not new. Since the 60s, with the whole Earth catalog, Stuart Brand, they've been thinking about how we can use the resources of the globe and share. Why is Europe not getting all of its energy, for instance, from the Sahara? We could build solar fields in the Sahara that would be fantastic and, and get the energy up to Europe, right? Well, there, that was Bucky Filler, who was also playing this world game, the Damaxion, which is all about how we could share resources along the planet. And then you have the famous Rainer Bannum, who really was an interesting guy, who said, of course, architecture is much to be important to be left to architects. So we formed this kind of new vision of an architectural firm, which is the urban thing thing. He believed technology and would save the world. Well, I think he was wrong. We might have to go back. Right? So the city is a complex place of elements that must come together to form the city. But if we think about modernity, um, we should think of it in three terms. Let's say 19th century, 20th century, 21st century. 19th century uh, was the Industrial Revolution, Hausmann plans, spatial planning, of course, you know. 20th century, tabula rasa, modernity, infrastructure, mobility. And the third time we are now, 21st century, it'll be all about microspaces, reprogramming the existing city we have, and of course, dealing with informality and maybe um, a spatial justice. So what's not 
okay in this world we're living is the amount of poverty. That's what's not sustainable in this world today. If you look at the globe, we made this map with Harvard, we pixelated the projected, the future growth of the world, and of course Africa, as you see, will grow the most. India, of course, South America has already grown quite a bit. And here you see that most of the new urbanization will be in Africa. And that will be the last part of this lecture today. But how did we confront this problem? We went to mayors and we tried to convince them that they had to invest their money into the poorest areas of city. And what did they have behind their map, behind their backs on the map? They had white spots. White spots where most of the population lived. That was Petare in Caracas. 800,000 people lived in what was green zones, park land, right? Because if they acknowledged that people were living in the park land, they would have to distribute the income of their, of their city mayor's fund with equally among the population. So it was better to ignore them. So this is what that looks like. You have a formal city and an informal city. This is not a casualty. This is not fortuitous. This is actually man-made. This is a, a division of an old farm that was expropriated with a highway and then some deals. So what I want to say is urbanization is political and you must engage the politics. And Eyal will talk much more about that a little bit later. But what do those cities really look like? So the first thing is to understand where we should invest. This is Caracas, and everything in red is the exact mapping, first time ever done, of the size of the barrios and the poor slums of Caracas. But then we can look at Rio. Rio has a very different composition. It has 1,600 little pockets of small slums. And again, we can look here at Buenos Aires with another distribution. And what's interesting is to see that, or Bogota, that has a big strip along the bottom. So what's interesting is that all cities have re request, uh, request different solutions. And this is Tijuana at the Mexico-San Diego border. Of course, this is also man-made. It is the free trade agreement that brought the maquilas and the cheap workers to this border and edge. So these are not new things. It's all about uh, access and actual social justice. People must start to really invest. If not, we will get sprawled and actually uh, it will be uh, disastrous politically and also ecologically. So there's a right to infrastructure. There's a right to housing. There's a right to defend against natural disasters. And there's a right to man-made disasters. People need democratic cities. How do we create that? Transparent cities, safe homes. And we need to rethink our understanding of urbanization. We need to think and understand why we, we build. Do we need to build? And where do we build? Interpret what to build and where to act and identify with whom to act. That's the important thing. And debunk the myths of poverty and marginality. Because not everyone who lives in these communities is poor. And in fact, there's a huge economy that can be unleashed. And it, what, it, it's actually very good for society to unleash that economy. So we have now a second wave of immigrants coming into Europe. So it can be also relevant for Europe. We shouldn't just think in a one-way street. Europe has a responsibility. Now maybe some of you know this little book here, very important for the history of architecture, Version Architecture by Le Corbusier, towards a new architecture, but you didn't maybe know that his original cover was called Architecture or Revolution. He was coming from Moscow, he knew that either we built architecture and social housing or we would get revolution. So he invented the domino house, which was uh, just a concrete floor side, the image of modernity, but it was to be filled with the cheapest available material or the rubble of the First World War. He was thinking socially, uh, and, and architecture cannot be disengaged from the social. And of course, that model has become the model to build from Athens to Caracas, no informal building. And here you see two pictures of that five years apart. People know how to build cities. What they don't have is access to resources. They're not in legality. And it's just a shift 
of mind that we need. Here you see the building a little bit unfinished, but give them a chance and they'll put a balcony, stuck work, and finish it. But there's no legislation. Mayors cannot legislate because we're still thinking in 20th century modernism. We're still thinking that we color plants red, blue, green for residents, for play, for park. No, cities are complex and overlapping. So this is Horacio Genaro, very interesting uh, um, character. He single-handedly built a slum of which is now 700,000 people. He and his brother, this is their archival photographs, they banked, they made allotments on the hill they, for their uh, uh, cousins, sisters, brothers, and they took over the land and built the city because no one was going to build that city. There were immigrants arriving. It's almost like a refugee camp. They were coming from Colombia, uh, and Peru, etc. They banked the hill, and over time, the hills were transformed. Now, those of you say, but this is not the correct way to build a city. Most of Europe, medieval cities were built that way. They were not built with parcels and land and, and earths and, and, and zoning rights. No, that didn't exist, right? So these are kind of new medieval cities. But it's also happening in the center of modern cities. This is the Torre David, you might have heard of, which is an occupied the tallest squat in the world, probably. Now, uh, now it's been evacuated by the government with military, and, but for a long time it was a very interesting project of a building that was just floor slabs abandoned, 45 floors in the air, and people needing refugee a status squatted it and built their houses inside. First arriving as a tent camp, then building a few walls, and over time, and we aided them in a, in a year's research project, finishing the apartments, and the apartments are quite good. Their aspirations are the same of everyone. These are the interiors of Torre David. Yet the government did not believe in the solution. It's a shame. But to bring you closer to home, you have Hans Wittmar in 83, who writes Bolo Bolo, and in 1972, Jean Havraken talks about this idea of an open building, an open building that could be finished over time. Bolo Bolo, actually, the result of Bolo Bolo, these ideas of living collectively, of sharing collectively, is actually, there's one example in Zurich, very good one, not only the squats in Zurich, which are interesting in, in different Altstaaten, etc., but there's actually a realized, organized project, which is called Kalbreite on the top of the uh, uh, tram depot um, in Zurich, which is a group of people who came together to build with the city a kind of collective house, of which this book uh, is the thesis. But we also have a historic image of site of James Wines of parking garages that are occupied. So we started to think about that, and we looked into parking garages around the world. And they're actually very good as housing. Do we need parking garages? We should get rid of the car. We should go in tuk-tuks, electric tuk-tuks, electric bicycles. We should walk more, right? So maybe we can transform those parking garages, as you see here, and we can maybe give them to refugee status, right? We have a problem. 800,000 refugees coming into Germany, right? Where are they going to put them? So maybe the parking garages are very good because they're very generic in size, and they can be adapted very well. And so that they have a nice condition of a ramp system, so you can even bicycle up to your house, so you can have a to-do, right? And so we can fill them not only with houses, but we can fill them with shops, startup companies. It can be quite diverse. And so let me take you through that idea, first parking garage, then starting a house, and then over time, we could create a whole new ecology, right? But you see, there's no legislation for that. What are we going to do? We have to convince someone to experiment. So it's about the city as a laboratory. We need more experiments, finance, right? And architects have been the culprits. We are not the saviors. We're not the star architects. We are the culprits. We have been complicit in the segregation and spatialization of cities by taking on projects that we shouldn't have. So this is now Cape Town. Now I take you into a very practical project, which many of you have sponsored, and I thank many of you in this room for helping me realize this experiment. So one, one million people in the Cape Flats, right up to the beach of Kailiche, are living in precarious houses. 
So this was apartheid fragmented urbanism, traces and fragments. Here you see the, the different color codes. You can see black African colored, Indian, Asian, white, and other. You see a segregated Cape Town. And this is now 2011. It's basically the same map. Nothing has happened in the last uh, uh, 20 years since apartheid ended. So what do we do? So I think design can make a change. And we're certainly going to try. So this is Kalicha. This is the mapping. It's this. Is, well, we zoom into this zone of 70,000, 700,000 people, right into this little square. Because today, the architect who wants to make some experiments should make them in the developing world. That's where it's most needed, and that's where most policy change needs to happen. So how do you do that from a distance, from Zurich, from ETH? Well, we need extension. We need people who are the bridges to these areas, which are NGOs. So the extension, the natural extension to the architect's work is community NGOs. So we go zoom into this, 68 households, 250 people living in this corner of shacks, and what do we do? Well, we engage Pumezo. Pumezo is the community leader. He's half blind. We invited him to Switzerland. We brought him with the NGO. We started to talk about it. We went down there several times. And he volunteered something so precious to him. His house, with eight people living inside, he volunteered to knock it down. So we started to sketch, well, what could we do? How could we uh, knock down the house and build a new one in two days? So we came up with this kind of double story shack. And there he had a new house with a little bit better clip block. We financed it with very little money. We raised it off the ground. The moves were minimum, just so it didn't flood, because the Cape Flats flood. It's sand, right? So we have this oppositional movement between kind of design research and on the ground empiricism. So we need a knowledge ecology. We need to create a wealth of knowledge to, to change these places. So together the TH with solar um, engineers, with sanitation engineers, with digital uh, uh, programmers, structural engineers, we came together as a group and we called it EmpowerShack. But what do we do? We don't invent abstractly cool uh, uh, digital monsters that can build houses. No, we need to employ labor, right? We need the community involved. We can't have a monolithic company like a brick company selling the product of, I don't know, plastic bricks. To, to build houses? No. What you want is the cheapest available material available for everyone to build their house. So we saw this house already, this double story shack, we, and we got an idea. We saw another one. He was already building uh, shops underneath his house. So we started to say, if we raise the house two stories, we could then open shops and a new economy could happen. And we are even going to raise it three stories now. And we made a double story shack very simple, it's just a quick fix, illegally, we put it in the face of government and we said, come on guys, in two days we built this, why can't you do anything about it, right? We had an exhibition, many of you know, a catalog that tried to deal with the issues, but we said, who pays now? What do we do? How do we finance this whole change, right? So let me take you quickly through it. So we went to each one of the settlers, uh, in the area, mapped out what was their income levels, we mapped out what the size of their houses were, each one with different size of houses, and we made a proposal. Here's the proposal, it's this simple. You have older individuals with very little money. They've been there for 20 years, they're retired, and, they're, and then you have some younger individuals who are newcomers to the area, who are actually engaging in the informal economy. And they have money, but they have no land. So the blue is little land, the red is lots of land. So you have these two individuals living on the same plot of land. But if we exchange money for land, we can get a more equalized situation. So we invented what we call a land release credit. If, they, if the guy who has the big footprint of a house releases a little bit of his house, 
give some of the land to the other guy, he increases his house, we can then have a more unified territory and we can get an economy going. So how do we do that? So we build more units, so we have a profit on rentals or sales, we have a residence discount, which is this land release credit, we have a subsidy, which the government should do for 50%, uh, a subject which they already have implemented a housing program, and then we have the land release credit, then we have 25% of the house is financed by the individual, because that's all he can finance, right? So who pays? So existing residents, new residents, state, and donors. And together, some of you have helped us. So the design position goes this way. We map, we trace out by making triangulations between each corner of the house. We make the final mapping. We, we discover who has what, and we begin a game. Where do you want to live? Where's your house? And we have discussions in community all together. We map out the sizes of the houses. And then we invented a little technology. Yes, Rainer Bannon was right, maybe. The technology could be we put in the area, we, with the area has been mapped out, we, we make a road, we show the community where a new road could go, we need to move some houses, and, then, and we then map the house, we take it out, we reshape it, give it a new dimension, and then we work out very carefully what his financial model will be, and he then says who wants to live next to him, and then we reshape the community. I will go quickly, it's a process, and at the end of the process, we have the 68 households in one day, all together, already agreeing on some kind of plan to move forward, right? It looks something like this. This is the game, we move a house, we move it again, we move it again, and we iterate and we create a new urbanization, but one house at a time, with no displacement and no evacuation of people. And we reorganize. So it looks a little bit more precise now this way. Houses are moved, moved, one, and slowly but surely. But of course, this process takes a long time. Who really wants to do it? No developer, no housing constructor wants to get involved in this. They're also scared to get robbed. We've been robbed twice. Yes, it's full of problems. It's very difficult, but we need an we have an army of unemployed engineers and an army of unemployed architects and an army of unemployed young people in the barrios who could actually in the slums and the favelas in the shacks who could then assist in this process to reblock out. We call this advanced reblocking to incremental compliance. We give them structured compliance. It is formalization. They will get their house. They will get a land title, but it will be over time. Again, like the medieval city. We will block it out over time. And then, of course, we introduce a few more elements, which is light, energy, TV, internet, batteries, solar batteries, and we imagine the whole thing as a solar field with feed-in tariff right into the system where they would get discounts. And here you see a little bit of a mapping of the house and how it feeds into the system and they get a discount. So they're going to take care of those solar panels. They're making money. But then we cluster them all together and they can all share internet and TV. So they don't pay for it individually, but they share. It's a new shared and collective uh, economy. Almost done. Of course, toilets. They're living without toilets. It's unbelievable, the situation. This is all the city's able to provide. These kind of porta potties. It's terrible, right? And water, one tap. But there's green spaces. And actually, um, we can actually use all the runoff water to create little urban planting. It's not going to solve the world, but it can do medicinal herbs. It can create a new economy. And in the neighboring school, we can start an urban agricultural program. Or we can attach it onto the houses, and they can have a livelihood. And so you see a whole new ecology. It changes the environment, the trees, the heat, also, which of course all of you know. And this is kind of the image, the architect's rendering an image. and what and. Here you see the first shack we did, now painted and adapted, and there at the very end, yes, three minutes, we're almost over. So this is the last slide. So the new houses that you've all been waiting for is a very dense row house typology made out of concrete block, and the inside of the house, it's only half a house. It's only 
concrete block and the community builds out the interior. Here you see us planting the first trees. You see it's a frame so that fire doesn't catch because just one month ago in Masipu Maledi, 1,000 houses burnt down with fire because someone knocks over a kerosene lamp in the night and with the wind, the fire spreads. So we're very careful to make the division walls in concrete and the community builds out the interior themselves. Should be one more slide. Let's see if it moves. There we go. Here you see the back now being infilled together, and it's and the community is actually choosing how many windows they have depending on their income levels. There'll be 100, 100 houses of these forming that um, area that you saw and that plan. And these and people are incredibly happy who have moved in. And these are kind of the thresholds to get into the house and they have each one a toilet now, a new toilet. And I urge you all to join us, Urban Think Tank, it's www.u-tt.com if you want to join in. And please uh, come down to South Africa. Thank you. example as well. Um, so we're kind of running uh, short on time, but I would like to allow at least one or two questions from the audience to you, if you like to put it down. I really enjoyed it very much. It's fantastic and inspirational. Um, one of my questions is how you go in and, and talk to the community. Who do you approach? And, how do you bring the people together? Well, as I said, the NGOs are, are key, right? But you know, we could even walk in parts of Zurich that, that are actually run down and difficult, and you will always find people willing to engage and tell you about the problems of neighbor, whether that be the abandoners of Paris. If we think about it, when we visit a city, whether that's Paris, London, or, or Zurich, we're only looking at it. We did a study on Paris. Tourists really only go to about 5%, not even 3% of the area, of the metropolitan area of Paris. So it's actually, we, even in our own cities in Europe, we hardly know the outside. So, and people are willing. And then you might say, no, there's a kind of resistance, like a Marxist resistance between people coming in. People are desperate, and they're very happy. And NGOs are very happy to find links and bridges to technology and to funding. So I think it's actually not too difficult. And, um, and if we all went out and engaged just our neighborhood, it would be actually fantastic. In fact, in Holland, people are organizing themselves around neighborhoods and creating neighborhood associations. And those are the ones that Arctic should work with. Thank you. question, are you only focusing right now on South America and Africa, or are you just kind of open to everything? No, we have been called by different places. Usually we get the hardest tasks. So in Nagaland, in India, in the border between China, the most contested area, militarized zone, uh, it only has one road going in these hills. It's, it's pretty crazy. And they want a cable car system. So we're, we, together with the Austrian company, Doppelmayr, and we work with partners very closely from the industry. We're working to put in a cable car now in India. Um, and, uh, and we have worked also in Jordan very carefully, uh, in Recife, in the area where actually one of the um, uh, terrorists of 9-11 was born, in a very difficult area to create a women's community center. So we are a little bit Wherever we get uh, a call. So 
this is interesting to a uh, short breakfast conversation with Rich Rose about saving the world. <laughs> so uh, one question would maybe be whether some of these uh, more specific solutions for certain local conditions uh, you're considered to be in some way universal solutions <laughs> for problems that are found at different place, places, in different contexts, and to what extent, because you were referring also to fragments of the land, this the extra terrestrial view, or to the globe, this kind of global perspective, the, the technology as, as a possible solution, and question, questioning this approach. But at the same time, also the referring to the uh, generic structures of the parking lot, and these infrastructural of course, very, um, um, uh, well researched and uh, micro invasive infrastructure seem to be a way towards finding more or less universal solutions. Is that a goal? How do you? Sure, so, so I'll be very clear on that, right? Um, we're writing now maybe a draft uh, idea of a book, which is kind of the pleasure of failure. We know that we've been back at knocking on people's doors for ages to try and get more stuff done. And we somewhat have not been able to do all the work we wanted to do. So there is an element of failure. But at least we leave little micro tests. It's like little uh, sprinkles of things that are kind of referring back to former 1960s, 70s examples. There's been a history of people doing intervention from in Peru, uh, Alba Van Eyck, you know, Team 10, Robert Smith. There's been a, 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 a real history of small interventions that we are just adding on to. And if it's just a dry toilet, that can then be reproduced 100 times, 200 times, 300 times, iterated. Um, our design perspective into that is to make the structure, the framework for it. So we as designers now create that open building, that open frame. We don't care how it gets painted, finished, uh, what material is going to, as long as the intelligence of the design goes into the design of the generic framework and maybe the, the, the strategic structuring of the idea. There's one last question. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this book. Very, very inspirational. Um, I'm curious a little bit more about financial sustainability and what type of funding you need, what type of seed funding you've had, and kind of what could have the potential, but are you planning to depend on you know, external funding, or will it be self-generating? Can you maybe talk a little bit about no, I think, I think uh, all we can do, because I'm not really a developer, I'm not, a, I'm not really an impresario uh, to take it to scale. So I need someone else to take it to scale. All I can do as a designer is maybe do the, the pro, right? The prototype 101, right? Um, but if the prototype is correctly thought through, it will have the sustainability to be taken to scale. But of course, there becomes the tension between the state that has to deal with their own uh, uh, population and, um, and maybe the private developers who want to make uh, so much of a profit that they don't want to engage. So we had welfare states. Right? Well, first states were pretty good. A lot of people said that the, those blocks that were built all in the banlieues of Paris are terrible. That's not true. The architecture was okay. Harlem was okay at a certain point. It could have been upgraded. What happened was we stopped investing in that. So the welfare state broke down and Paris began to burn, right? And then everything was shifted into the private domain. And private domain wasn't going to solve the problem of the poorest. Right? So we need to find a gap between a state-run project, let's say, of, of housing, RDP, uh, housing, let's say, and a shack. There's no middle ground. So maybe we can create this kind of middle ground, which is kind of a framework for incremental compliance. So it's half the house. So maybe we can't give them the full house because it won't feed into a sustainable financial model, but we can let them build their house to completion over time. But isn't that what we all do, kind of? We upgrade our kitchen, we add a room, right? And uh, of course we have more means maybe to do that, but there's no legal framework. So the real challenge is to get lawyers on board to tackle the policy.